fluid resuscitation in the patients with shock. Today we'll discuss the types of shock, the pathophysiology related to those types of shock. Resuscitating the patient with fluid, including endpoints of resuscitation when monitoring lactate and base deficits. We'll discuss GI issues with resuscitation. We'll also discuss vascular access and review agents used in resuscitating the patient. Finally, we'll conclude with hematological issues that may be associated resuscitating the patient with shock. The definitions of shock, particularly when related to hypovolemic, include the state of insufficient perfusion of vital organs with consecutive imbalance of oxygen supply and demand due to an intravascular volume deficiency with critically impaired cardiac preload. Typically, hypovolemic shock is associated with low blood volumes due to acute blood loss or dehydration or decreased plasma volume. There are three major categories of shock and they are defined as cardiogenic, hypovolemic, and septic. These types include septic shock where there is inadequate tissue oxygenation or prolonged and severe hypotension and shock with probable vasodilation. Each of these can cause massive vasodilation and further loss of perfusion. This picture here includes a laceration that was caused by a machete. The patient presented with a large laceration to the right flank across the posterior portion of the scapula. Although the wound is large, there is a significant amount of blood loss in this type of wound. The patient can become acutely uh, in shock and become uh, hypotensive due to extreme and pro prolonged blood loss. This is considered a life-threatening injury, although there is no acute blood loss in this picture that is noted. The causes of vasodilatory shock include sepsis, inadequate tissue oxygenation in the cases of nitrogen intoxication. Uh, this is some of the patients you might see on the hospital service, in critical care, and even in ICU. Carbon monoxide intoxication is another example of inadequate tox oxygenation. We can have prolonged and severe hypotension due to hemorrhagic cardiogenic shock or cardiopulmonary bypass. Shock with probable vasodilatation include metformin intoxication. Some mitochondrial diseases can also cause vasodilation, cyanide poisoning, and cardiac arrest with pulseless electrical activity. This diagram demonstrates the regulation in a normal state of vascular smooth muscle tone. This is important to remember when we're discussing shock because these regulatory mechanisms provide constriction, decrease of the lumen of the blood vessels to perfuse. In normal states where there is plenty of oxygen perfusion, these receptors on the cell wall which help to uh, increase vasodilatation and vasoconstriction are normal functioning. They include angiotensin, norepinephrine, and the calcium channels. As calcium stores within the uh, intracellular space interact with these receptors and calcium channel channels on the uh, cellular wall, the calcium will bind to form kinase and myosin. Myosin typically increases and this can cause vasoconstriction. This is important because vasoconstriction then decreases the size of the lumen increases intraluminal pressure and therefore increases perfusion to the tissues. In a anaerobic state where there's not a plentiful supply of oxygen and this is uh, decreased oxygenation, nitric oxide is then formed. Another pathway using atrial natriuretic uh, peptide is released through these channels. Kinase and myo 
myosin phosphatase are formed. This decreases the amount of myosin, and we then see vasodilation or hypotension in the patient in shock. So overall, this diagram demonstrates in environments of plenty of oxygen or an oxygen-rich environment, these normal channels using calcium channel stores cause vasoconstriction. In states where there's hypotension, the presence of nitric oxide is increased. A decrease in myosin phosphatase results in decreased myosin and ultimately vasodilation and hypotension. The effect of membrane potential on the regulation of vascular tone. During the resting potential, vasoconstriction, as we showed in the previous point, occurs here where you have normal uh, norepinephrine calcium channels and of course this is the plasma membrane of the cell. During hyperpolarization, calcium channels are then closed and blocked. You're not able to um, have a vasoconstriction in the previous slide and you'll have a decrease in the energy that's used in the cell, namely ATP, adenosine triphosphate, hydrogen ions are then increased causing an increase in a, an acidic environment, a low pH, and then an increase or an abnormal production of lactate. This causes intracellular potassium to be released through calcium and potassium channels. This will ultimately lead into an increase in serum potassium. In the lower portion of this diagram, we see um, a decrease in ATP also an increase in hydrogen ions and an increase in lactate. This has to do with uh, the administration and treatment of sulfonylureas that we can also see in some of our patient populations that we treat in the critical care and acute settings. Mechanisms of vasodilatory shock include sepsis, which we may see plenty of that in the acute care setting, particularly on the hospital service, or tissue hypoxia with lactic acidosis. If you look on the left-hand side of the screen, we'll see that an increase in nitric oxide synthase will cause an increase in nitric oxide. This is typically due to poor oxygen states. This uh, opens the potassium-calcium channels which uh, ultimately increases um, CGMP or decreases cytoplasmic calcium. Cytoplasmic calcium will decrease the amount of phosphorylated myosin like we saw on the other screen. This results in vasodilatation. Other causes of vasodilatation include decreased ATP, increased hydrogen ions, and an increase in lactate for the vascular smooth muscle like we saw on the last slide ultimately results in vasodilatation. Another path for vasodilatation where there is patients that have um, shock or an increase in lactic acid, we may see an increase in vasopressin secretion. Ultimately, this depletes the stores of vasopressin, which provides vascular tone. This decreases vasopressin and the body is unable then to provide proper tissue perfusion. There is a negative feedback control of endogenous acid production. This includes on the left hand side of your screen a acid load or a low pH. This uh, results in an endogenous acid production including ketoacidosis or lactic acidosis. This may be the DKA patient. The lactic acid may be a patient that is hypovolemic. Um, they could also be uh, in shock from some infectious source like in sepsis. Patients who experience systemic increases in pH or alkalotic can also cause uh, ultimately this negative feedback mechanism um, that result in a systemic pH that is low. I wanted to show you this screen. It's very important to look at patients who are in shock and are acidotic. Typically, we see providers ordering large amounts of bicarb to correct the pH. This slide demonstrates the dangers of overshoot alkalosis. 
the body functions particularly well in shock states and a moderately low pH or low acidic environment. Alkalotic environments are very, very dangerous. In fact, there is a higher mortality rate associated with alkalotic environments as opposed to uh, acidotic. So these are the normal ranges of a sodium of 140, a chloride of 106, a PaCO2 of 40 with a pH of 7.40. We know that a normal pH is 7.35 to 7.45. That's why I've chosen to provide a 7.4 as normal. In a severe organic acidotic environment with a pH is 7.05, a provider decides to administer a large dose of sodium bicarb to correct the pH. Sodium bicarbonate has high levels of sodium uh, and chloride. Um, and in fact, it can correct uh, or overcorrect on a bicarb. So we administer the bicarb, uh, and this is the overshoot alkalosis. It results in a bicarbonate of 28. The sodium and chloride are not particularly changed, but the PCO2 is 30 now and a pH of 7.45 with large amounts of sodium bicarbonate administered. This is 4 to 5 amps of sodium bicarb. The patient now is particularly at risk for um, a higher mortality as opposed to a 7.05 acidosis. This is an important slide to remember as well too. This shows hypovolemic shock. This can also occur in patients that are dehydrated, trauma, but we can also talk about patients that um, who are septic that require large amounts of fluid. Clinical signs are very important, particularly in patients who are not beta blocked clinically. So if you see a patient uh, that you suspect it might be an early shock, the heart rate is one of the first things as a provider that I ask. I wanted to show you that a blood volume uh, percentage up to 15% really doesn't demonstrate uh, a decrease in heart rate or a change in heart rate. In fact, the patient can lose up to 30% of the blood volume with no pulse rate change. However, it requires at least a 30 to 40% blood loss to demonstrate a clinical change or a physiological change of a heart rate of 120. The blood pressure does begin to decrease. We see a pulse pressure uh, decrease. The respiratory rate uh, is mildly elevated even in class 2 shocks where there's up to 15 to 30 percent of blood loss. Certainly the urinary output is decreased uh, and the patient shows clinical signs including mildly anxious or even confused in class 3. The current clinical practice, practice and evidence-based medicine suggests that we give blood early. However, it does take a while to order blood and prepare for patients that you're suspicious that have a significantly blood loss or in hypovolemic shock. We choose crystalloids. This is normal saline or LR, and we'll discuss that in some of the later slides about what, what to choose. So when you're assessing the patient, you certainly want to uh, assess for the causes. Uh, shock and hypotension can be caused by hypovolemia from uh, hemorrhagic or blood loss until proven otherwise. If shock and hypotension persist, another cause may be sought, including cardiogenic or septic. The most common cause of continued instability is under resuscitation and not active bleeding. I chose this uh, particular image. This is a patient that we provided care for on the trauma service. This is a stab wound to the abdomen. This is not intestines or small intestine. This is, this is actually the omentum that was pulled out. This patient is certainly at risk for uh, severe and acute intra-abdominal blood loss uh, and requires an operative procedure. Choosing fluids. When you're managing patients that are in hypovolemic shock or even septic shock, the providers or the nursing personnel may request fluid resuscitation, and we'll talk about that uh, in depth. Fluid resuscitation is the subject of much debate right now, and particularly what choice of fluids. The debate still is not fully resolved, and many of the medical community um, disagree on what crystalloid to choose. There is a crystalloid versus colloid controversy. Um, this suggests that some of the medicine, internal medicine, 
uh, and even some of the hospital and service prefer colloids uh, like albumin over crystalloids like uh, lactated ringers and normal saline. However, the current standard is a balanced salt solution, uh, and that salt solution is lactated ringers, and I'll show you this in subsequent slides, uh, particularly in a patient that uh, has trauma or even presents to the critical care unit. These are patients also uh, that are at risk for sepsis and who are admitted to the hospital. Uh, they may require fluid resuscitation, and I'll suggest and recommend that we use LR for resuscitating these patients, uh, with the exception of a few. To date, blood and colloids have not really improved uh, survival rates as compared to the crystalloids. That's why we still use the crystalloids. Resuscitation with fluids. Well, when we resuscitate patients, uh, there is a phenomenon which occurs that is associated with interstitial edema. Adequate resuscitation of interstitial space usually results in peripheral edema. We do not attempt to resolve this interstitial edema from resuscitation with uh, diuretics like Lasix. This is uh, simply a secondary effect uh, due to endothelial dysfunction and, and leaking uh, fluids out into the interstitial space. We typically just ignore it. Uh, and the mobilization of fluids actually will occur later in recovery. Resuscitation fluids. So the composition, well, crystalloids are named for the principal ingredient in these fluids, salt. So the most common are 0.9% saline or what we know as normal saline and lactated ringers. Normal saline is somewhat really of a misnomer. It's, it's slightly hypertonic and it's very closely related or matches uh, plasma. And I'll show you a diagram here shortly. While there's no really proven benefit over normal saline, LR does have less sodium and chloride, and this is particularly what I choose as a provider. Uh, this image here is a traumatic train versus pedestrian victim. Uh, this person um, was uh, hit by a train. Uh, as you can see, these are both of his femurs here with significant blood loss just because of loss of limb. Uh, the bleeding is controlled. The patient did survive. So let's talk about uh, the composition of fluids. So this is our fluid column, the plasma, uh, normal saline, and LR. So in plasma, uh, our normal blood plasma, there is a sodium of 141, chloride 103, potassium 4 to 5, calcium 5, mag 2, and of course this is our, our bicarbonate that we get when we get uh, some of the laboratory work. Normal saline is comprised uh, solely of uh, sodium and chloride. Sodium is a positive ion. Chloride is a negative or uh, an anion. Uh, LR is more closely related to our plasma. As you can see, it has 130 uh, milliequivalents of sodium as our plasma has 141. Uh, chloride has 109 based to 103 on the plasma and has a potassium of 4, calcium of 3, no magnesium, and a buffering agent of 28, which is very closely related to your serum plasma. It's one of the reasons why I personally choose uh, LR as a resuscitative fluid. Parameters of fluid requirements include serum lactate. So these are the lactates that we're ordering. Many of the facilities also have what's called a reflex lab. So if you order a lactate uh, and if it doesn't uh, fit within the normal range, within two hours, this blood is drawn again until the lactate is um, within the normal range. So if you look closely, uh, a metabolic waste product from anaerobic metabolism. So when folks are... Uh, in shock, whether it's septic, hypovolemic, cardiogenic, we check a lactate, and this is the reason why. It speaks to the level of anaerobic metabolism. Anything greater than 2.5 millimoles per liter is considered as abnormal lactate, and we want to treat that particularly with fluids. If they need blood, we'll give blood. Base excess. Base excess is defined as the, uh, the amount of base required to restore a normal pH. Normal is negative 2 to positive 2 milliequivalents per liter. It's really a calculated volume and not an actual like a lactate. 
um, but this is what we want the normal to be. Of course, if we have something less than negative 2, it just means they have a base deficit, and we want to treat that with fluid as well, too, to try to get it into that normal range. So what are endpoints of resuscitation? Endpoints of resuscitation mean, when do I stop resuscitating? We want to decide these parameters before we actually um, start the resuscitative period. And these are the things that we suggest that you look at when you're managing patients, particularly on a floor who are particularly ill or in the critical care. So these are the endpoints of resuscitation, whether they're shock, hemorrhagic, or cardiogenic. Uh, the clinical markers include the serum lactate. I want the lactate to be less than 2.5, a base SS uh, between uh, plus or minus 2. They need to be hemodynamically stable. Is their blood pressure 90 and remains 90 despite uh, continued fluid resuscitation? And of course, all their vital signs, if they're not beta blocked, make sure that their heart rate is within a normal range, and we typically shoot for less than 100. The resuscitation endpoints include goal-directed therapy, meaning the patient is hypotensive and I'm going to continue to give fluids, continue to check lactates, look at base excess until I have a goal of a lactate of 2, a base excess within the range of plus or minus 2, no hemodynamic instability, and vital signs remain consistently stable. I also want to consider oxygenation status as I've continued to give fluids. Remember we said these fluids actually increase interstitial edema and they can also happen in the lungs and they can become fluid overloaded. Whether in the presence of congestive heart failure or not, this is something to consider. Also consider perfusion status. If you continue to give fluids uh, and they look well perfused, a warm capillary refill, those kind of clinical markers are something that I definitely want to look at for uh, stopping the resuscitation. Well, how much is too much? If they continue to be refractory or unresponsive to your therapy, the complications are what we would look at. If they have increasing interstitial edema, particularly pulmonary edema, uh, or they occlude their airway with lots of volume, this is the time to stop, whether the clinical markers are uh, resolved in normal ranges or not. So we also look at the arterial base deficit as we discussed. It's a useful parameter to determining resuscitation. You can get this on ABGs. Um, it's the degree of anaerobic metabolism um, proportional to the depth and severity of hemorrhagic shock, even septic shock. So arterial pH is really not as useful as it is defended by the body's compensatory mechanisms. We talked about the pH really uh, when it's low, it's the body's normal compensatory mechanism, and this is very valuable. In fact, if I had a choice, I would choose a patient that was acidotic over alkalotic. High base deficits are also associated with uh, lower blood pressures and also greater fluid um, requirements. So I'm going to look at some examples here. Uh, so that stratify some of these base excess and deficits. If we look at... Um, the stratification, a mild shock with a base excess of negative 2 to 5, um, it would be described as moderate shock if their base excess was 6 to 14. Uh, it's definitely severe if it's greater than 14. Two-thirds of patients with increasing base deficit have an ongoing blood loss. Base deficits along with lactate, blood products um, requirements is really a good predictor of mortality. This is a, kind of a complicated way of saying if you continue to give fluid to these patients and they don't respond, then the mortality rate uh, over the next 24 to 48 hours is very high. Let's also look at base deficit changes over time really may be more predictive than looking at the pH. Many providers look at the pH as a marker to um, provide care. However, base de deficit may be a little more accurate. Among trauma patients having normalized lactates, those with a persistently high base deficits really have a greater risk of multi-system organ failure. We see increases in base deficits between their arrival to the emergency department and admission to the ICU or the floor. Um, these are associated with hemodynamic instability, high transfusion requirements, metabolic and coagulation abnormalities, and actually increased risk of death. Elevated base deficit is really predictive of mortality and complications more than any other parameter. 
uh, but also like to look at lactates as well too. So if it is elevated and it's refractory, uh, they may need more blood transfusions in the presence of hemorrhagic shock, risk of organ failure, and actually ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome. The risk of lung injury is, is quite high if the base deficits are greater than six, um, and they may show pre propensity for ALI or acute lung injury. Increased lactate and base deficits uh, paired during the first 24 hours have uh, increased levels of cytokines, including interleukin-6. Uh, when we see elevated levels of IL-6, it's particularly associated with ALI or ARDS. If patients have alcohol on board, uh, it can be confounded. Uh, alcohol worsens base deficits. We know that base deficits that are greater than four are concerning in, in intoxicated patients, whereas a base deficits of two concerning in a non-intoxicated patient. When patients receive large amounts of fluid, particularly normal saline, there is a phenomenon which occurs which is called hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. This is high serum levels of chloride, which causes a metabolic acidosis. Remember several slides later, uh, previously we discussed that chloride is an anion, uh, which can cause uh, a worsening uh, pH. These fluids also may increase base deficit. Acidosis is secondary to hyperchloremia, which is associated with uh, lower uh, mortality rates. So for ongoing lactate assessment, just as base excess, we look at the initial lactate levels. They're very important, and that's why we see patients that present to the emergency department. We want to get patients that have sepsis, hemorrhagic shock, or even cardiogenic shock. We need to get a really early lactate. So if you see a patient that presents, it has a propensity to uh, maybe become septic, uh, it doesn't hurt to get a baseline lactate. We can look at this particularly if they present uh, to the emergency department. Uh, response of lactate to fluid resuscitation uh, is very important. And that's why we give fluid, check a lactate, give fluid, check a lactate, or if they need blood, we can give blood products. It also provides a predictive value in, in hypovolemic shock. So we know lactate is a prognostic indicator for normalization. If you correct the lactate, uh, less than two in the first 24 hours, the patient typically has a greater than 90% survivability within 2040 to 48 hours, a 25% mortality rates. Um, and if it's greater than 48 hours, you can't correct it, the mortality rates are increased um, up to 80% or greater. So predictive values for multi-organ dysfunction syndrome include initial and peak lactate levels. We want to get those. Uh, the duration of hyperlactemia. So if they have lactic acid that um, persists beyond 48 hours, the mortality rate certainly increases. And all of these are associated with the development of a multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. Peak lactate levels following resuscitation as a reperfusion occurs, the lactates actually may increase. So don't be fooled when you have a lactate of 4 and you give 2 liters of fluid uh, and the lactate rises to 4.5. It just may mean that you're clearing that lactate um, and it will dilute, dilute out and they'll actually uh, release this extra lactate in their urine. So this is called false, these are called false peaks. Uh, where you have a pH and base deficits may be more um, predictable. So cardiovascular signs, uh, particularly in the vital signs, obviously if someone is not beta blocked in the heart rate, we should see tachycardia. If nursing personnel call and describe to you that the patient is tachycardic and there's a high propensity for them to have septic shock, hemorrhagic shock, hypovolemic shock, or even cardiogenic shock. These are the things that I think about when the nurse calls. If they have tachycardia, what is the physiological changes that can cause that? It could be fever, they could be hypoxic, they could simply just have pain. Certainly hypovolemia or hemorrhagic pathologies, in fact they can even have ischemic pathologies. The blood pressure of course, uh, I I'm not 
particularly focused on the systolic or diastolic, I do ask them to calculate a mean arterial pressure. For a patient that's in shock, I want to have a goal of mean arterial pressure greater than or equal to 60 millimeters mercury pressure. And this also provides further trending whether the patient um, has a fluctuation in their systolic blood pressure. It may not be immediately indicative of perfusion status. Uh, the goal for a MAP varies depending on patient presentations, but typically uh, we like to shoot for a 90. So hemodynamic monitoring, particularly in ICU, uh, if you're on the floor, this may not be as valuable, but you want to know the waveforms, uh, dislodgement, migration, and malposition of any kind of intervascular lines are identified by the critical care nurse first, and they're the ones that will be calling us. So you want to listen if uh, one of the critical care nurses actually calls you. So our vascular access devices for resuscitation include peripheral IVs or a HEPLOC IV, any kind of outside lines that the patient presents with, we certainly want to take those out. And a peripheral IV is always the first choice uh, when we're resuscitating patients. It's very, very common uh, for the nursing personnel while they're resuscitating patients to a large volume of fluid to request a central line access, but actually peripheral IVs are our first choice. For cardiovascular access, we also use hemodynamic monitoring. We have to know these waveforms as well. So vascular access devices include central lines if the peripheral IVs are not functional. Uh, this includes triple lumen or a large cordis. As in this picture, sometimes we may have to use the hemodialysis catheter. If there is a hemodialysis catheter, I would ask that you call nephrology and ask permission to use it <clears throat> before using. As for triple lumen and uh, the cortis, remove only if suspected uh, as an infectious source. Cortises can be removed or changed over wire uh, once the uh, PA potential um, is not applicable. Uh, potential source for bloodstream infections, particularly if they're not used well or often, uh, and also obviously there are potential for air emboli. Shiley devices or hemodialysis uh, devices uh, can be uh, used as well too. They are typically only placed in the femoral or IJ anatomical positions. So let's talk about pharmacological agents. This includes vasor, vasopressors. Um, they're not always the first choice for hypotension. Uh, usually fluid and blood products are. Uh, the choice of pressors may depend really on uh, the facility or faculty or the attending. The types of pressors that we use include vasopressin, levofed, dopamine, epinephrine, and nitroprusside. So you definitely want to do a cardiovascular assessment, including uh, ask the nurse about the heart sounds, the rate, the rhythm, whether they have good peripheral perfusion, including capillary refill, warm or cool to the touch, and also uh, check the peripheral pulses. So solid organ injuries and trauma patients that we may be taking care of uh, may also include uh, the liver, uh, spleen, and even pancreas. These are graded. Uh, in size of injury from one to uh, four. These are determined by the percentage of hematoma of the organ. Obviously, the lower the grade, the smaller the hematoma. Typically, a grade one is associated with less than 10% hematoma of the solid organ, up to greater than 60%, which is grade five, actually. So the treatment for most of these is embolization. Sometimes we do just observe these patients or surgical removal, like a uh, partial uh, liver uh, hepatotectomy or splenectomy. Uh, many of these patients result in an open abdomen. Um, and this is uh, an example of a patient who actually had shock, uh, was resuscitated, and ended up having his abdomen left open. Uh, we do use wound vacs now if you ever see a surgical patient like that and we're managing them, but um, 
you want to keep this abdomen open and drain the extra fluid because they can develop uh, an acute abdomen or uh, abdominal um, compartment syndrome. So abdominal compartment syndromes include measuring bladder pressures, decreased urinary output, decrease um, pulse pressures, and also increase airway pressures because this can also result in high intrathoracic pressures as well. What's more common now is um, abdominal wall wound vax for patients with large uh, open abdomens. It requires continuous suction, maintain adequate seals, can have a tremendous amount of large volume uh, of fluid loss, and particularly if their fascia is open, large amounts as well too. So if we want to feed these patients, we have a hierarchical uh, method of feeding. Typically, you want to feed them enterally first, uh, peripheral nutrition, and then, of course, uh, total per per perineral nutrition. For uh, gut feedings, uh, the residuals, um, the minimum, typically have to be greater than or equal to 200 cc's, and, of course, flush these tools um, as well, too. So transfusion uh, therapy uh, includes mechanics of treatment. So we obviously have to have established a large bore IV, uh, always have wide open access. These are 16, 18 gauge or central line. You want to think about bleeding and clotting, uh, transfusing. We may even consider pack red blood cell transfusion. If we get greater than three to four pack cells, we'll be obligated to give platelets. And for patients with large amounts of uh, blood loss, we need to consider cryoprecipitate or factor seven. And then, of course, look at the electrolyte replacement because we're adding large volumes of just plasma. We're shooting for what's called euboxic states. It's a Latin word for eupnea, normal. And we really like to try to keep all these uh, electrolytes within um, the normal ranges. So one thing we look at uh, for resuscitation in blood is the hemoglobin and hematocrit. They're, they're indicators for oxygen carrying capacity and may require blood transfusions, but there's a lot of debate about the threshold for transfusion, um, and particularly in the medicine patients, but also surgical patients as well too. We know that really a hemoglobin of se of of 7.0 is adequate for perfusion. We typically don't transfuse greater than seven unless your, your hospitalist or surgeon requires uh, some um, different um, model. So let's talk about um, platelets. Your platelets, um, typically this low platelets are called thrombocytopenia. The state um, is our goal for 50,000. So really, you don't ever want to give patients any kind of platelet resuscitation unless they have platelets less than 50. Uh, if they're 20,000, you might consider transfusion, but it's still not a threshold. Threshold 20,000 is definitely the threshold for transfusing. If the signs and symptoms of acute diffuse bleeding may be um, may be indicative of that, you want to go ahead and transfuse. Um, thrombo. Cytosis is just the opposite of that. Some patients um, end up having platelets greater than a million. In that case, you, you want to give aspirin therapy because it is a antiplatelet um, pharmaceutical. All right, uh, hematological continue. We'll look at the blood products. So for every one unit of pack cell, you want to give a six pack of platelets plus uh, fresh frozen plasma. So as you start getting uh, an upwards of two and three pack blood cells, you, you're going to end up matching this with um, six, uh, six pack of platelets and FFP. FFP and factor seven given with extreme blood loss is very rare. I don't expect us to be doing that. And then remember during hypovolemic shock, crystalloids really provide only volume expansion and not oxygen carrying capacity. And this is why we choose to give blood as well. So in concluding, we talked about the types of shock, the pathophysiology, some of the fluid resuscitative techniques, the endpoints of resuscitation, including looking at lactate and base deficits and what those mean in the presence of shock and hemorrhagic shock, septic shock. Uh, 
We talked about some of the GI issues, vascular access, and also how to manage these patients in hematological states. So if you have any questions, you can please contact us at the Global Training Institute. Our website is globaltraining.institute. Um, we have a 1-800 number, 888 number you can always call. Uh, and thank you for joining us today.